F. F. Bruce, in the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, says God is the archetypal father. All other fatherhood is a more or less imperfect copy of his perfect fatherhood. All of us who are fathers are imperfect copies of God's perfect fatherhood. The late Dr. Robert Schuller of Crystal Cathedral fame in Garden Grove, California, determined early in his ministry to be a failure so that he could be a success. He said, I determined early that I would be a failure at pastoring so I could be successful at parenting. He said, I determined that I would never be a great golfer because I'm too busy trying to be a great preacher. Dr. Shuler said, I never wanted to succeed at my hobbies and fail as a husband. I never wanted to be a public success and a private failure. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, established churches in Galatia composed primarily of Gentiles who eagerly received the gospel. But in his absence, Judaizers had persuaded them to adopt Jewish practices. And they were trying to persuade them that you had to become Jewish before you could become Christian, particularly with circumcision in mind. In the letter to the Galatians, Paul criticizes them for their fickle and feeble turning away from the gospel that they said that they first believed. In verse 1, he writes, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you not to obey the truth? Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? or by hearing of faith. His point was that the law, while it was necessary, the law was only to be temporary. And what is temporary is not particularly necessary unless it serves its purpose. And the law had served its purpose, and when Jesus came, he said, I came not to destroy the law but I came as its fulfillment uh, Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 talking about Abraham says and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness I wish I had two or three more Bible readers look with me in chapter 3 there's a one or two verses I want to point out to you that talks about what I just got through talking about in verse 3, he says, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? In verse 7, he says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Verse 8 reads, And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Verse 10 reads, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Verse 13 reads, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone 
that hangeth on a tree. Verse 16 reads, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, Not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Verse 19 reads, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of of a mediator. Verses 21 through 23. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be delivered. Listen to me. I want to talk about faith past. Verses 23 and 24 is talking about faith that is past. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. To bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That word kept under the law has a negative connotation and a positive connotation. The negative connotation of kept under the law is kept in custody as if to be guarded by a prison guard. It pictures Positively, a loving God acting as a shepherd, protecting his people from wolves that would have otherwise destroyed them if they were not bound and kept under the law. That word shut up in that same verse is the picture of a sheep pen with the shepherd guarding the entryway so that wolves, ravenous wolves, do not get in and tear up the sheep. Jesus said, I am the door of the sheepfold. And if you come in any other way, I wish I had a Bible reader. You come in as a thief and a robber. Here, it, here, here, here is the picture. The sheep pen was an enclosure where sheep were kept when they were bedded down for the night. But there was not a gate across the entrance way. The shepherd himself would lay down in front of the entrance to the sheep pen so that if a wolf tried to get in, it had to get in over the shepherd. That's why Jesus said, I'm the door, I'm the gateway. No wolf, no, no lion, no ravenous beast can attack you if you're in the sheep pen. Hmm. Paul is saying to us that God gave the law as a mentor to guide the people of Israel as a way of preparing them for Christ. Moses and the prophets represented the law. But, but when the law had served its purpose, John the Baptist came saying, there's another one coming whose shoes I'm not even worthy to unlatch. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. I, I, I brought you as far as I could, the law says, but now I've got to turn you over to the mediator of the law. Um, when Christ came, he changed the emphasis from salvation by merit or salvation by works to salvation through the grace of God 
by faith in Jesus Christ. That word schoolmaster in the text is a, is a, is a Greek word, and the Greek word is pedagogos. Pedagogos. That's a good way to cuss somebody out. Pedagogos. Uh, pedagogos. Uh, it, it, it means a schoolmaster. It's the combination of two words. Pais, which means child, and agagos, which means teacher or mentor. So a pedagogos is a child teacher. The law was a child teacher. It was a mentor to corral us, to keep us in place until the real authority of the law showed up. Because once the authority comes who wrote the law, the law is no longer necessary because it's no longer now on tablets of stone, it's on the tables of your heart. Um, some of you was raised like I was raised. Some of you were raised like I was raised. And, and, and when we were growing up years ago, our parents, our mother especially, gave us some boundaries. Um, we, we were raised, uh, the last four of us were raised at 720 South Beulah Street, Eunice, Louisiana, 70535. Our boundaries were between Ms. Hilda Hayes' house and Mr. Isaac's snowball stand. That, that was our boundaries. We could go to Ms. Hilda and play with Dion, or we could go down the street and Pamela would give us a free snowball. We were supposed to pay for it, but Mr. Isaac was sleeping most of the time, so Pamela would give us a free snowball. She became my girlfriend because she would give us free snowballs. But, but the boundaries of the pride land for us was Miss Hilda and Mr. Isaac. And, 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 and I since discovered that my mother kept us in those limits, in that fence, in that boundary, because she wanted us in earshot. Because when she called, we had to answer. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Now, 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 that was a small enclosure, but it was freedom within those boundaries. And you and I who've been called by Jesus Christ through faith in him and the grace of God, we are free to do only what he calls us to do. Your freedom does not give you no restriction. Your freedom gives you boundaries to do what God wants you to do. So stand fast in the liberty that Christ has made you free. And whom the Son has set free, he is free indeed and I thought that was a large place when I was growing up but I came to discover that my mother wanted us in earshot because when she called us we had to answer because she was the one in authority and when God decides he wants to use us he wants us in earshot so that when he calls we will do whatever he says because he's the one in authority. You are not free to do what you want to do. You are free to do only what God says to do. Yeah. That's faith past. But in verses 25 through 27, as I hurry, is faith present. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a pedagogos, a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
Once a child has grown to maturity, you got to take the pacifier out of your mouth. Once a child grows to maturity, you got to stop drinking milk. You got to start eating solid food. Because your, your digestive system uh, has matured. Your ability to handle things have matured. And there are some Christians who are still babies and immature. And you got to be careful how you handle them and careful how you talk to them and make sure they're always pleased and always patting them on the back. And you got to put them on the program and then you got to make sure they're doing all right. And you got to call them every week and you got to make sure that they're not sick and you got to make sure everything going right. Grow up! You ought not need a pastor always holding your hand. You ought to know how to pray for yourself. Because there's some stuff life is going to bring you through that you can't call me. You're going to have to know how to pray for yourself. Have I got a witness here? I need somebody who's been through some storms on your own who know how to say, Father... I stretch. <sighs> Listen. Here it is. 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 Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood like a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a man, when I grew up, when I matured in my faith, I put away childish things. There's nothing more unsightly there's a woman in her 70s trying to act like she's in her 40s. A man in his 60s trying to act like he's in his 30s. Your, your, your days for that is gone. Grow up. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. Grow up. Listen, he says, we, 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 we respect the Jewish law and we perhaps revere the law, the Ten Commandments, because we find great wisdom in the laws and the statutes of God. But we no longer look to the law for salvation. Because salvation has now come in the person of Jesus Christ. He says, we put on Christ. The Greek word for put on means to put on a garment. It means to clothe oneself. It means to get dressed in the things of God. When Paul talks about putting on Christ... He uses this clothing metaphor to describe a transformation that God has wrought in their lives. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. I hadn't thought about this. This just came to my mind. Uh, as a child growing up again, down, down in Eunice where I'm from, we used to play church. And, and, and I would get some old glasses and put them on like my pastor and get a long coat that fit me all the way past my knees. And, and, and Winky and Gwen was the usher and Johnny was my deacon. And I would preach funerals of dogs and cats. 
And Johnny would fall all out. They'd have to catch him because they were my ushers. Because we were playing church. We put on play clothes. I put on play glasses. Because we were playing church. And then we would pray playing like they prayed. I would pray like Brother Richard Walker. Because he prayed the same prayer every Sunday. Lord, here I am, knee bent and body bowed. They must have prayed like that in your church too. I thank you that the bed I laid in was not my cooling board. And he never would say cover. He said the kivers that I lay in was not my winding sheet. And then he would say, I want to thank you for a reasonable portion of my health and strength. I'd put those glasses on and those old clothes on and play praying. But now I put these glasses on and these clothes on because I'm not playing no more. Here I am. Once more and again with a reasonable portion of my health and strength. I wish I had somebody to help me here. Some of y'all still play in church but some of us here are for real this morning. Because we know what God has brought us through, what God has brought us over, what God has brought us around, and what God has brought us to. People who have put on Christ, people who have put on Christ are new people redeemed people forgiven people people whose demeanor and actions externally reflect what that God has given them a new heart internally my scholars Bible scholars consider Paul's letter to the Galatians as a rough draft of his letter to the Romans. Because in the book of Romans, Paul expands on ideas that he had written initially to the church at Galatia. The church at Galatia receives the rough draft of Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome. Because in Rome chapter, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, he expands on what he just got through saying to the church at Galatia. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Our elders didn't have any theology. But they said it like this. I looked at my hands. And my hands looked new. I looked at my feet. And they did too. I started to walk. And I had a new walk. I started to talk. And I had a new talk. Their hands were not new. It just looked new because they were saved. And what they were doing, they took their hands from what did not please God and put their hands on what gave God glory. And if you're not going to put your heart in it, don't put your hands on it. Hmm. Let me see if I can help us with that. You remember when they were transporting the Ark of the Covenant? And uh, they had it on this ox cart. And that was not God's instruction for how to transport it. They were supposed to take brass poles 
and put it between the golden rings on the Ark of the Covenant. But they decided to carry it the way they wanted to carry it. And they put it on an ox cart. And the oxen stumbled. And when the oxen stumbled, the cart, the Ark of the Covenant, almost fell off that cart. And Uzzah put his hands on it to keep it from falling. And God killed Uzzah right there on the spot because don't touch holy things with your hands if your heart is not in it. Whatever God called you to do in this church, do it with all your heart or don't put your hands on it. If you're not going to sing with all your heart, put the microphone down. If you're not going to teach with all your heart or preach with all your heart, because listen, if you ain't buying what you're selling, you can't convince nobody else to buy it. If the gospel you preach does not make you happy, then you sure can't make nobody else happy with it. I'm through. But I want to talk finally about faith in the future. Verses 28 through 29. I've talked about faith past when faith had not yet come. And then since faith has come, and I want you to look with me now in verses 28 through 29. This is what happens, faith in the future. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I'm through. But Paul mentions some of the many divisions that separated people in the church at Galatia. Jew versus Greek. Slave versus free. Male Versus female. In our day it would include rich versus poor. Literate versus illiterate. Developing world versus third world. Minority, black, white against each other. Asian versus European. Socialist versus capitalist. Conservative versus liberal, Democrat versus Republican, Baptist versus Methodist, Catholic versus Episcopalian. The most segregated hour of the week is Sunday morning. Because we gather in our holy conclaves and we have become just us society. Matter of fact, even within our own church, if we aren't careful, cliques can develop that you just want certain people on your pew. Talk back to me if you can. And if they're not there yet, you save a seat for them because you don't want nobody on your row who don't look like you. But God wants people in here who are gay, he wants people in here who are unwed mothers. He wants people in here who are divorced. He wants people in here who's got some drug habit. He wants folk in here who are alcoholics sitting right next to folk with master's degree. Because in the body of Christ, every last one of us got to come to the feet of Jesus. PhD or no D. All of us got to come to the feet of Jesus. Because a PhD without some G-O-D makes you a smart devil. I 
come through. But these divisions are not comprehensive. These divisions are illustrative. Because he's saying that in Christ, in Jesus Christ, Paul is saying to us that there is no differentiation. It, it just so happens that this Father's Day is Juneteenth celebration across the nation. When, when I was growing up as a boy, we did not celebrate that holiday in Louisiana. I did not hear of Juneteenth until I moved to Texas. But in order to appreciate what Juneteenth means as it relates to scripture and our shouting on Sunday morning, you got to go back with me two and a half years before Juneteenth to a watch night service. We still celebrate New Year's Eve watch night for this reason. That Abraham Lincoln in 1862, December 31st, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But it would not go in effect until 1201, January 1, 1863. So to make sure that they were hearing what they heard, they watched all night to make sure that they heard it when they got the freedom word. Somebody ought to help me close here. And when they got the freedom word, they started testifying and shouting and dancing and giving God glory because what they had prayed for for now over 250 years had finally come to pass. But for two and a half years, after watch night in Pennsylvania in 1863, people here in Texas had not yet received the freedom word. They had been freed, but had not yet heard it. And for that reason, they worked 900 more days when they were already free. You gonna help me close this, won't you? Some of y'all in here this morning have been set free. But you're still acting like a slave. You haven't clapped your hands. You haven't opened your mouth. You haven't told God thank you. You haven't spoken to anybody because you're just as tight-lipped and mad and frustrated as a slave. But let me give you a freedom word. You don't have to thank Abraham Lincoln this morning. Why don't you thank God for your freedom? You haven't been freed with the stroke of a pen. You've been freed by the shedding of some blood. Because one Friday, I wish I had help to close here. One Friday on a hill called Calvary, Abraham Lincoln had nothing to do with Calvary. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but he had nothing to do with Calvary. It was at Calvary that God signed my IOU because there were handwritten ordinances that were placed against me and I needed a kinsman redeemer who would come and sign my IOU. I owed a debt I could not pay. So he came and paid a debt that he did not owe. Jesus signed my IOU. Jesus came and wrote it in his own blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus is there anybody here know you've been set free is there anybody here know that the stuff that was holding you back Jesus dropped the charges the stuff that was pulling you down Jesus dropped the charges and when Jesus dropped the charges you stood before God the Father and he said lift up your head O ye gates and be lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty the lord mighty in the battle he dropped the charges so the case is dismissed and since the case is dismissed shout like you've been set free since the case is dismissed why don't you tell God thank you thank you for dropping the charges thank you that you went to Calvary thank you he died didn't he die but right up right up Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hand you're gonna help me close it won't you now I want to hear now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy to the only wise God who is our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, not just today, not just tomorrow, not just next year, but forever, forever, forever. Why don't you look at somebody, look at your neighbor, Tell them I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. 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 I'm no he's all Jesus for my salvation tragedies are commonplace all kinds of diseases people are slipping away the economy is down people can't get enough pain but as for me all I can say is thank you Lord for all you've done for me it could have been me outdoors with no food and no clothes all left alone without a friend just another number with a tragic end but he didn't see fit to let none of those things be I'm saved by his power saved by his power he keeps on he keeps on, 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 he keeps 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know he's all right. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. If you come to Jesus, he makes no distinctions. He does not hold your past against you. He does not bring up anything you've done. He says, whosoever will, let him come.